My Bear Hunt with General Wade Hampton by John P. Burhans, writing under the pen name Greybeard, an article first appearing in the Turf, Field, and Farm, New York City, September 27, 1872, read by James T. McCafferty, www.canebreaks.com. Editors, Turf, Field, and Farm. It is now more than 15 years since I passed through that soul-harassing, closed-tearing, brain-exciting experience eclipsed a bear hunt, and I am frank to confess that I never felt anxious to go on another. Not that I don't like the bear in the abstract. I do. But in the concrete. Messrs. Editors of the Turf Field and Farm, I say it solemnly. Give me the chances of shipwreck, a lighted cigar in a powder mill, the rattling volley of a line of battle, a kerosene lamp explosion. Anything, in short, that has a reputation for being dangerous, in preference to four or five hundred pounds of wild meat that runs riot without chart or compass, ignores all rules of legitimate sport, and requires a flask of powder, a score of rifle shots, and the salient argument of a bowie knife, before you can enjoy the satisfaction of knowing your game is so eminently dead as to deserve an obituary notice. I'll tell you all about it as a rest from my summer labors. I determined to devote a couple of the autumn months to a jaunt westward. I did so. Rifle in hand, I had spent a considerable portion of the fall of 1856 on the prairies. I had hobnobbed with Indians until I could give a Comanche war whoop like a native. Drank hair-trigger liquid lightning with the trappers until they agreed I was entitled to vote. And shot buffalo from my Mustang until it seemed like murder to kill any more. In fact, I was tired with sport and had reached St. Paul on my journey east, when who should unexpectedly turn up but my old friend Jim Cavanaugh, for years afterward a delegate and member of Congress from the new western territories and states, a born pioneer. The meeting was mutually cordial, and after exchanging the usual salutary compliments, our conversation ended in my agreeing to accompany him on an expedition down the Mississippi on the following day. He was going to look after some land along the river, knew all the planters worth knowing, and could promise an amount of pleasure that would make me feel as happy as Adam and Eve before they knew anything about original sin. So he said. This was certainly a change, and it suited me. Past St. Louis, past Memphis, past all the pretty islands that have doubtless once been in a state of solution, past great bends and bluffs against which the father of waters had written the wrinkles of his age, past great plantations where thousands of acres, flecked with the snow of southern summer, foretold the wealth that would in a few months pour into the coffers of the successful cotton planter, until at last we reached Helena, Arkansas. This was my friend's destination a quiet, inconsiderable frontier town at that time, where boats wooded up and merchants landed supplies. Our traps had not been at the hotel more than an hour when who should make his appearance at the hotel but Colonel Wade Hampton. Like ourselves, a temporary sojourner, he having come up for the knots on an errand from his plantation several miles below. To describe the man is scarcely necessary. For pen and ink descriptions, as he has appeared in the character of the leader of the Confederate cavalry in the late Uncivil War, have made his person familiar to almost every reader of every newspaper in the country. At that time, however, he was the plain Southern planter, a perfect type of his class, and never a better exemplification of their hospitable characteristics than when finding us to be gentlemen of some culture, question mark, he pressed us to accompany him on his return homeward and partake of such pleasure as his place afforded. I remember that, among other things, he proposed a bear hunt, and I, fool-like, jumped at the idea like a schoolboy. But I won't anticipate. Have you ever been on a southern plantation in old times and witnessed the working of the vast social machine? If not, let me tell you the story in a few words. Here are 980 slaves, the property of one person. 
We land from the steamboat soon after they have finished their respective tasks for the day, and as we pass through the little village which they constitute, there is not a man, woman, or child who does not come rushing from his cabin to bow or curtsy. Howdy, Moss Wade! with all the enthusiasm of unadulterated affection. The mansion itself sets back from the river on high ground, and as we approach, there are a score more of hunting dogs of various breeds that gather from their sleeping spots to give us welcome. The house servants, stable boys, garden and field hands mingle with the quadrupeds, and there's a wagging of tongues and a wagging of tails that unmistakably attest the earnestness of the welcome that is accorded to Moss Wade and his friend. Externally, the house seems made of piazzas and pillars. Internally, you might imagine you were in a palace, where art had brought its contributions of books, pictures, and sculpture to make home beautiful. A night's rest on the downiest of beds, a dawn broken by the appearance of a body servant with a cup of hot coffee while we were yet on our backs, followed by a plate of fresh oranges and figs, and we were refreshingly prepared to dress. A breakfast on game and the usual luxuries of plantation life, for which, by the way, an appetite had been prepared by an old-fashioned infusion of peach and honey, what planter's house is complete without it, and we were ready to take horses at the door for our hunt. We were to go some ten or twelve miles into the cane break and to spend the night. Three or four servants, Old attendants of the colonel in these hunting expeditions followed with the dogs and provisions for the trip. Ah, it was an occasion not to be forgotten, and it comes back to me now, albeit nearly a generation of years have swept by, crowded by grander incidents of life, as fresh and sharp-cut as if it were a picture of yesterday. The balmy air that gave tone to every nerve and luxury to every sense the rich lowland growth sending forth from jasmine and magnolia the perfume for which my old wife used to pay a dollar and a half a bottle and be satisfied with a third-rate imitation, the stately steps of our blooded horses as we now and then broke into a gentle canter, the course of the dogs who, free from leash, roam through the woods at will, stirring up the smaller game and making the neighborhood musical with their glad notes the jolly cachinations of the old-time servants, who, while not forgetful of the homage they owed their master, still enjoyed a freedom from restraint and an equality with him that would have made an abolitionist look in wonderment on the spectacle. These and a thousand other details come back to me with a power that sends a gush of young blood to every microscopic extremity of my sanguineous system. We reached our hunting ground about two o'clock in the day, lunched, loaded our rifles, and in an hour more, we're ready to take to the bush. Now, said the colonel, if you are not familiar with the bear, be careful. Don't take him into close quarters. Put a ball through his heart before he can reach you with his paw. But if you fail to do this, stand not on the order of your going. Leave. And by the way, he added, whatever you do, save the dogs. I knew as much about bear hunting as I did about elephants, had seen the beast tame in menageries, and once or twice encountered a wild one, but no rifle shot of mine had ever yet penetrated the shaggy coat of a Bruin, and my ambition was on edge to be gratified. Besides, I had just come from the plains and felt big with the reputation which all fledglings innately enjoy who have knocked down a dozen or twenty buffalo. Well, we separated and got to work. I had taken the stand which the colonel had assigned to me to await his movements and those of the dogs who were to drive up the game while he made a circuit. Whither he went or what he did, I have no knowledge. I only remember that for nearly two hours I waited patiently, listening to every sound, trembling with expectation, and braved down to the pulp of my index finger that rested on the trigger of my trusty rifle. In fact, I had begun to grow dreamy, and my thoughts were wandering among the scenes of home life far eastward. Suddenly there was a long halloo, a shot, and then another. The dogs were baying and evidently in full pursuit of game. What it was, whether of deer or bear, of course I had no means of knowing. 
but instinctively I felt it was coming toward the little branch whereon I had been stationed. It was a question of less than five minutes, but in that interval I enjoyed the keen zest of a sportsman's expectation. I had settled in my mind where I was to send my rifle ball, where I would bleed my trophy when down, and what I would do in various triumphant contingencies that were pictured in my mind. But alas, the schemes of men aft ganga glay. Bruin, for it was the full-sized beast of that nomenclature, made his appearance with a rush, tearing through the canebrake, a hound hanging to one ear and the pack close on his heels. I raised my rifle and fired, and have long been satisfied that the bullet sped at least fifteen feet above its mark. At any rate, it didn't hit him while the sound of the discharge served to draw his attention to a new and unexpected adversary, and that was your humble servant. Despite the fact that he carried the weight of a dog and a bullet from the gun from General Hampton, he turned his blood-red eyes on me. And with an ugly expression around his mouth, which I regarded at the time as physiognomically dangerous, made directly for the position I occupied. At the same instant, a brace of hounds, God bless them, dashing through the cane with a glad yelp and a bound, seized the bear, one by the haunches and another by the flank. The digression saved me. I had no other resource than to take to a tree or the bush. I never was good at climbing and chose the latter, plunging pell-mell into the cane with an impetus likened to that of a demoralized locomotive. Fortunately, I struck a path, one of those narrow openings which are sometimes worn on the Mississippi bottoms by animals making their way to water. But horror of horrors, I had not proceeded fifty yards before I heard close behind me the sound of the pursuing bear. Frantic with the pain of the chawing bites every instant penetrating his flesh, Bruin had doubtless taken one of his old roots and instinctively hoped to brush or shake his tormentors off in the thick undergrowth. On he came, closer and closer, the brittle reeds crackling under his feet, the hounds giving their short, sharp, ugly yelps, and I dashing forward as best I could through the almost impenetrable mass. It seemed as if I could feel the hot breath of the brute upon my back, and I realized as only a man in such an emergency can do, that if once he laid his claws upon me, I was a dead man. My knife was already drawn. Life seemed to hang but by a thread, and I was prepared to do battle over that thin tie while there was a muscle left to put forth its strength. Yet stay. Suddenly, in less time than I can describe it, there was a crashing of reeds in front of me. In an instant more, General Hampton, hot and flushed with pursuit, his clothes torn and his fine face lighted up with that keen, bold expression which I can fancy illuminated it on many another occasion in the hour of danger afterwards, stood face to face with me. It was but a second. He took in the situation at a glance. Like myself, he could almost feel the presence of the bear now twenty steps behind. Seizing me by the breast, he pushed me back into the wilderness of canes perhaps three or four feet, at any rate out of the narrow path, and exclaimed as I fell backward, Stay there as you value your life. Don't move an inch. At the same moment, darting forward, he dropped on his knee and cocking his rifle, waited. I can't describe the interval, it was so short, but it seemed as if before I could gasp, the bear was on him. He fired, coolly and steadily as if he were shooting at ducks. The bear gave a groan, but the pace was unslacked. He dashed on, up to the very muzzle of the remaining gun barrel. The general was in the act of pulling the trigger, when a cane, slipping from under his feet, flew upward like a spring, and striking the weapon... The gun was discharged high in the air. In the twinkling of an eye, the general was on the ground, struck down by the forepaw of the enraged brute, but knife in hand and as cool as if promenading in his own piazza. I sprang forward to his assistance, but he shouted to me to stand back. He was lying almost at full length with the bear, while the latter was being torn and distracted by the dogs, now in full force and doubly frantic, seeing their master in his power. It was but the work of a moment, but I shouldn't forget the scene in a month of centuries. 
The general's right arm and knife were under the animal, but with the motion quick as a flash, he threw the other arm over the body and, clutching the knife, drove it deep into the heart of the brute. There was a spasmodic stroke of the paw in the direction of the stroke of the blade, for a bear always strikes out in the direction from whence it experiences pain. A fact, by the way, which saved the face and body of the general. And after a short convulsive spasm, the monster lay dead. And that is all. The dogs, with their jaws all bloody, were called off, save one, who lay in the brake panting in its death agony from wounds it had received. The general recovered his feet without a scratch, gathered his gun, wiped the bloody knife in the dark fur, sheathed it in an everyday sort of fashion. The servants came up, and after extravagantly pouring forth their congratulations with true enthusiasm, secured the carcass, and the whole party reunited around the campfire at nightfall, well satisfied with the adventures of the day. We killed another bear the next morning, shot four or five deer, and two of the servants got a fox. As for your humble servant, he was satiated with that kind of sport. As a faithful chronicler, I am bound to say that I was scared all the way through, from my Oz Frontis to my Astrologus, and since that time have respectfully declined all invitations to meet Bear on his native heather. In less than sixty days after the events I have recorded, I commenced to use hair dye and grew prematurely bald. I have remained barefooted on top of my head ever since, and whenever I want to tell my grandchildren an old-fashioned story to make their blood curdle and give them a first-class nightmare, I point to my denuded cranium and recount my adventures with General Wade Hampton and that four-footed quadruped of the wilderness. Signed, Greybeard. The End. <laughs>